Good morning. Everybody awake this morning? All right, good. Well, welcome to West Cobb Church. If you don't know, my name is Howard Cupcake, uh, Connections Pastor here, and thrilled to be up here teaching this morning as we are continuing this series called Religidiculous, where we're looking at the relig- uh, ridiculous rules of religion that many times keep us from experiencing all that God wants us to experience, keep us from ex- uh, discovering what it is to really follow him in, in the fullness that he desires for us. So we're kind of going through and taking a look at this through this series. Now, if you have your worship guide uh, that you were handed on the way in, there's a section in there to take some notes. I encourage you to take some notes today. There was a pen in the chair back in front of you. If you have your Bible with you, go ahead and open it up to Acts chapter 17. That's where we're going to be today, Acts chapter 17. If you don't have your Bible, we will have the verses up here on the screen, but we'll be picking up in verse 16. But again, encourage you uh, to take some notes today because I think we're going to challenge some of our thinking today. Now, With this series, we have really been challenging people, pushing people out of their comfort zone. We've upset some people and just challenging us in the way we think about uh, what we believe and so forth. And, And to all of that, I say good, seriously good. Because I believe that it is only when we are really challenged and asked some tough questions, when we're pushed out of our comfort zone and stuff, that we come to the point of really understanding what it is that we believe and why. And if you read through the Gospels, I would contend that this is what Jesus was the master at. Challenging people, pushing them out of their comfort zone, asking them thought-provoking questions to get them to think through things. And I believe that religidiculous is what Jesus would have said to the religious leaders and people and religious practices of his day. Now, let me make a few statements as we get rolling this morning. And these are statements that maybe most of us have thought, but maybe we didn't feel comfortable actually saying out loud, okay? And you might want to jot a few of these down in your notes, but the first one is, and and I think this is really important, by the way, not only for us as we kind of come to grips and get to you know, peel back some layers, if you will, and get down to what it is that, that we really believe and what it is that we do and how we live out this Christian faith and so forth. But I think it's really important that if we are a church that is on a mission to help people find and follow Jesus, we got to understand where they're at. And I would contend today that these five statements are definitely where they are at and what they are thinking with regards to church and Christianity. So here's the first one if you want to jot this down, and I'll just call it like it is. Religion is weird, okay? Religion is just many times weird. I mean, you might, you know, in your own religious context, whatever it is that you're used to, your background, you might be looking at that thing going, now why do we do it that way? And what's this all about? And why does this have to be done in this order? And so on. And even beyond all of that, you know, you travel, you go to other countries, and you see other people, other cultures, other religions, and how they do things, and that just makes no sense to me. That's just really kind of bizarre and out there. And this might be your first time here at West Cobb Church, and you might be looking around thinking, this place and these people are kind of weird. And that's okay, okay? We, we are kind of weird, but in a, in a good, good way, all right? But depending on what, it's a, it can just get really, really weird. I mean, maybe what you're used to is a very solemn, very quiet, you know, whatever kind of environment for worship or religion or whatever it is. And, and, and that's not really us, but, you know, we might go to what you're used to and think, oh, man, this is so boring. I'm not getting anything out of this, you know? I mean, for me personally, you know, I know where I was years ago and the direction my life was going in, and what, the, what the, the results probably would have been. And I know the winding you know, journey that I've had to go on, and the ups and the downs, and the heartaches, and the, and the tragedies, and the mountaintops, and all this kind of stuff. And I know where God has me at today, and how he's blessed me, and how he's using me, and those kinds of things. And you know what? Most of the time, I want to jump up and down and worship and celebrate my God because of what he's done. But again, just depending, sometimes in our own circles, sometimes we're looking at other circles, and religion can just be pretty weird. Here's another one. Religion can get pretty mystical, can it? You know, uh, it's all about you and the inside and, and chanting and meditating and clearing your mind. And I know that's a meaningful experience for some people. But if you're not a mystic and you're looking at mystics, it's like, come on, wake up, engage, Sparky. You know, things going on here. You know, but it can just be kind of, difficult in that way that it's mystical. Here's another one that's really hard for people to admit nowadays. That is that many times religion is superstitious. 
it can just get very, very superstitious, right? Oh, don't do that. Why? I don't know. But well, it's just, I've always been told never to do that. Bad things happen if you do that, right? Oh, don't do Make sure you do it in that certain way. Why? I don't know. Listen, anytime we're not doing things or doing things that we don't understand because we're afraid of upsetting God, the God's karma, whatever your thing is, you know what? That is called superstition. And while I'm on a roll this morning, let me offend a whole another group of people. I'm used to people being mad at me, so it's okay. <clears throat> another group of people. Those people who see the face of Mary in a tortilla, right? Or the face of Jesus in the bark on the side of a tree. Listen, I might be ignorant, but that's just goofy to me, okay? I mean, well, Mary, what if that's Liz instead of Mary? I mean, anybody got a picture of Mary or Jesus lying around? You know, and other people, they travel thousands of miles and they build a shrine, an altar, and they light candles and they rub beads together or whatever the thing is. Ooh, this place is sacred. No, that's superstitious. That's not what it's about. And here's another one for you. Religion can get very legalistic, can it? Religion can get very legalistic. Now, legalism is here are all the things that you have to do, all the hoops that you have to jump through, all the boxes you need to check off in order to get God to like you and love you. And if you're not able to do all of these things, God does not love you and neither do I. Have a nice day. Anybody experienced that kind of deal before? Yeah. You know, and, and, and as a result, you wind up experiencing what also is too often common in religion, which is you feel judged, right? You feel condemned, you feel judged because you don't do religion right. You can't check off all the boxes, you can't jump through all the hoops, you can't do all the things, so people look down on you in their self-righteous arrogance and, and, and because you can't do religion as well as they think they can do it. It's a very depressing thing that pushes a lot of people away, right? Now, what do we do when that happens? Oh, we try harder next week, right? We come forward, we recommit our lives, we light candles, we do com communion. Oh, and we just try harder and harder and harder to the point that finally we give up because we can't be good enough, so we just walk away. Anybody ever experienced that? I know I did. I grew up in a very fundamental legalistic Baptist background, and at one point I finally said, forget this nonsense, I'm out of here. I did not darken the doorway of a church for six and a half years and got about as far away from God as you could get. That legalism thing is a dangerous thing that turns a lot of people away. And here's one more, and then we'll begin diving into the meat of our message today. That is that religion becomes very hypocritical, doesn't it? There is a lot of hypocrisy in religion. In fact, <clears throat> here's what I believe is the truth, and a couple people might get upset with me for saying this today, and that's okay. But nobody, nobody, nobody does religion as well as we pretend to. Right? None of us can do this thing as well as sadly too often we pretend to. Why? Because we're human. Because we can't jump through all the hoops. Because we can't check off all the boxes. Because we can't do well enough. So as a result, we just pretend. And I don't know about your church background or religious background, <clears throat> but one of the things that really turned me off was, you know, that people just had this, 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 um, False facade, this fake, phony, false facade. They said, you know, like, I've got it all together and my life is always wonderful and I never have any problems. And if you've got problems, there's something wrong with you. You must not have enough faith or whatever the case might be. So they pretend. So I want to take you through a quick exercise that I've done with churches I've led, ministries, groups, things of that nature. And what I'm going to have you do here in just a second is look at somebody, look them in the eye here in just a minute, and then you're going to repeat after me something nice and loud to them, okay? So you're going to look at them, I'm going to say it, you're going to repeat it really loud to them, okay? So find somebody near you that you can look them in the eye, okay? Find somebody near you that you look in the eye and tell them, I'm messed up. I'm messed up. <clears throat> tell them you're messed up. 
Tell them we're all messed up. <clears throat> now, I've been doing that for years, and it always cracks me up how much louder the you're messed up is than the I'm messed up, but we'll deal with that another day, okay? So now that you kind of got the gist of this thing, find somebody else near you, and let's do this again. But this time, say it like you really mean it, okay? Nice and loud. Tell them I'm messed up. Tell them you're messed up. Tell them we're all messed up. Now, didn't that feel good to say? And do you know why it felt good to say? Because it's the truth. Hello. Folks, we are. We're all messed up. We're all trying to figure this. It amazes me sometimes. I was laughing with a friend recently how, you know, in my late 20s and early 30s, oh, man, I knew some things. (laughs) Don't try to tell me I was wrong either. But now that pushing up there a little ways, it always amazes me. You know, it's like I realize how much I've still yet to learn, how much I'm still trying to figure out this following Christ thing on a daily basis. You know? I mean, we, we can't put on that fake, phony facade. And the challenge that, that I've done with people is that we have to be open, honest, and real about our messed upness. I know that's not a real word. Just go with me. But we got to be open, honest, and real about this thing. I mean, not only for the sake of us being transparent and real and truthful, but also if we're going to be a church family that is on a mission to help people find and follow Jesus, they have to be able to relate to us, right? So we need to be open, honest, and real about it. But here's the goal. We can never, ever be content with our messed upness. And and what we should strive for is that because we are a church family, because we are doing life together and groups together and ministry together and missions together, that we are helping each other through God's power and God's grace to get a little bit better every single day. That should be the goal. And, you know, if you've walked away from religion, church, Christianity at some point because you had some kind of bad experience, I'm sorry, but let's not do that fake thing here. Again, as I've said, kind of touched on, religion has pushed more people away from God than it has ever brought toward God. You know, I, I've thrown this out there before and had churches like want to like come after me with pitchforks and stuff. You know, that I believe that Christianity, I'm not, you know, we've been kind of going broad scale religion. I'll pick on Christianity right now. That Christianity, because the things that have happened, been done over the centuries and so on, because of even in the last 20 to 50 years, you know, the legalism, the, the hypocrisy, the, the, all that kind of stuff. I believe we have done more as a whole umbrella thing here. I'm not picking on anybody in particular. But we have done more to put, hurt the cause of Christ than our spiritual enemy Satan could ever dream of. You know, we need to bring down some barriers, bring down some walls, and start allowing the love of Christ to just permeate everything that we do and say. So let's begin diving in. I'll push along on time here a little bit. Listen, the reason religion gets so weird and wacky and out there is because humans, flawed, messed up humans, have been trying to bridge the gap between us and God. They've been trying to bridge the gap between the sacred, the secular, the the perfect, the imperfect, the unknown and the known. And as flawed, messed up human beings, we have come up with some really weird, wacky ways of trying to bridge that gap. Now, innately, most people know that there is a God, okay? Every civilization since the very beginning of time has just innately, instinctively known that there is some kind of God out there, there who is either created this thing, orchestrating this thing, or some variation thereof. But they've all just known this. That it wasn't just two particles that nobody can explain where they came from, collided, and over the course of millions and billions of years, it just miraculously, coincidentally turned into this great cosmic accident that we are now all sitting in. You know? I think it takes more uh, faith to believe in that than it does to believe in God, and that people who really, really, really don't want to believe in a God are pretty much the only ones who buy into that. 
But most people innately know, something within us knows that there is something beyond us out there, a God of some kind out there. And again, humans have come up with some really, really weird ways of trying to bridge that gap. Now, when Christianity was started, and as Pastor Stan touched on earlier in this series, it originally was not called Christianity. Uh, that didn't happen for about 200 years. It was originally called the way because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But when this thing was started, you don't find all that weird, wacky religious nonsense. In fact, what you find is so liberating and so simple. So today I want us to dive into Acts chapter 17, picking up in verse 16, where the apostle Paul is in Athens, Greece. And he's having this fascinating conversation with these very, very religious people in Athens who believe in all of the different Greek gods. So let's pick up here. Verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So everywhere he goes, there's these statues, there's statues, there's these idols to all of these different gods. See, the people of Athens are very, very religious, but they're not sure exactly what to believe in, so they're trying to cover their bases with all of these different gods and statues. Verse 17, so he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. Verse 18, a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? So here is Paul trying to explain Jesus, the poor Jew who was a carpenter, who at one point was kind of a teacher and a prophet, but then he also happened to be the son of God who was tortured, nailed to a cross, died, was raised from the dead, which is not making any sense to these Athenian Greek people. Verse 18, it continues on. Others remarked he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Now, this is very important. Paul didn't just add to their worldview and say, hey, I know you got all this other stuff out here, but here's one more God I'd like to add to the mix that maybe we could build a statue to or something. Maybe he was Zeus's great, great, great grandnephew or something. No, Paul says, time out. We need to hit the reset button here. We need to start all over here. And he says in verse 19, then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus. Now, the Areopagus was this, this, this court kind of thing where they would bring in teachers and philosophers to hear all the latest ideas. Verse 19, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we want to know what they mean. I love verse 21 here. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. So these people would just gather together and pontificate, debate, discuss, all this kind of stuff. What was true? You know, kind of the fun stuff that some of us did for about a semester in college before we got on with our real lives, right? Just sit around debating what is true. That's what was happening here. Verse 22, Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So they've got all these shrines, all these statues, all these temples, all this everything to all of these different gods but they're still a little bit unsure of what to believe. So kind of just to cover their bases, they've got this additional shrine that is marked to an unknown God, which is what I tend to like to call their just-in-case God, right? Now, we might think that's a little funny, but how many Americans do the exact same thing? Oh, I don't really go to church, but you know, I'll go on Christmas and maybe Easter, and you know, I'm not really into religion and all that kind of stuff. But you know, I'll, I'll go take communion, or I'll go, I'll go um, do confession once a year, or you know, that's really not my thing. But I'm just trying to cover my bases, and that is many times how we approach our unknown God, and that's what was happening here in Athens. And you might want to jot this in the margin or in your notes somewhere, but. They had all kinds of ideas, but they had no certainty. And I think that describes a whole lot of people in our world today. Oh, lots of ideas, tons of ideas, but they had no certainty. 
Then in verse 23, it says, so you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. And Paul launches into this amazing sermon. Verse 24, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. So he's kind of giving them a little verbal smack in the face here, okay? And if you want to jot this in your margins as well, God is bigger than your religion. God is bigger than your religion. The, Lord of, the, the, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. Wake up, people. You're thinking way too small. Our God, God is bigger than your temples. He's bigger than your statues. He's bigger than your religious systems. He's bigger than anything. You people are thinking way too small. Verse 25. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. See, Paul knew his audience. And this could be a whole other talk for another time. But rather than going in there, you know, proverbial guns blazing, letting them know how evil they are and how wrong they are and they need to repent, turn and burn, turn or burn, or you're going to die and fry and all this kind of nonsense. Paul took the time to go in and study he, he learned about these people. He studied them and their culture and their religion. And he got to know all about them before beginning to address and try to have these conversations with them. And in this case, Paul knew that they would, they would bring money and food and lay them at these altars, lay them at these statues, and they just miraculously disappeared by the next morning. But, you know, so he's addressing that here. He knew his audience. Verse 26, from one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the times set for them and the exact places where they should live. And from that one statement, Paul pretty much disses the entire Greek and Roman philosophy of religion and gods, okay? That there's just one God, not dozens and dozens of gods and saints and prophets and all this kind of stuff, but one true God. And then in verse 27, Paul gives us the, his synopsis of what religion is really supposed to be about. He says, God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. If you're tracking your notes, why don't you underline seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him? Verse 28, for in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Verse 29, therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold and silver or stone, an image built by human design and skill. Again, he's bringing the hammer down here. Let him know all this stuff is, no, that's not God. That's not what it's supposed to be about. And then in verse 30, here comes the hammer. He says, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. As Pastor Stan has already mentioned earlier in this series, that word repent comes from an original Greek word that means to change your mind. To change your mind. Paul's like, Guys, it is time to change your thinking about God. It is time to change your thinking about how we connect with God. And then in verse 31, it says, For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. Now, this is a game-changing moment, this discussion with these very religious Athenian people. Paul's saying, you know what? The good news is that God decided to make himself known through the person of Jesus Christ. And he knew that we'd be skeptical. So he decided not to try to prove it in philosophy, not to try to prove it in theology, but rather to, tr to prove it in history by raising Jesus Christ from the dead. And oh, by the way, this only happened about a thousand miles from here. You can go there and some people who were firsthand eyewitnesses are still there where this all went down. And their names are Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Feel free to go talk to them. And then in verse 32, it says, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council, and some of the people became followers of Paul, and they believed. Now, here's my point in going through that story today. Perhaps you've had some kind of bad, negative experience in a religious 
or church context. And again, if that's you, I'm very sorry. But the truth is that if you begin peeling away all of the man-made nonsense that has gotten dogpiled on religion, dogpiled on Christianity, if you could begin to pull all of that away because all of that stuff has just messed this thing up and way overcomplicated this, but again, if you could peel that away, what you would find is so simple and so liberating. Paul is saying to the other religions of the world, no, you haven't been wrong about everything. It's just that your deal is incomplete. The fact that you know that we've got to reach out to God to try to connect with God is exactly right. And the great news is that God decided to reach back to you in the person of Jesus Christ so that you didn't have to live your life jumping through hoops and checking off boxes and doing all the weird, wacky stuff and living your life with no assurance right up to the very end when you're still not sure if you were good enough to make it into heaven. See, Jesus came and showed us how to live and how to love. And he was crucified and he was raised, thus proving he was the Lord of life and death, and he offers that to us. And here's a couple thoughts you might want to jot down in your margin as well. Again, for our benefit, but also to help equip us to be able to talk with others about this. See, religion is always asking who is right. Am I right? Are you right? Are they right? Oh, I must be right, and you must be wrong. And I'm better than you because I'm right, and you're wrong, right? Religion is always asking who is right. The question we ought to be asking is who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Who is this person? Not the, not the rules, not the religion, not, not all the, the hoops and all that stuff, but who is Jesus. Religion is also always asking, what does God want from us? What does God want from us? What is it I have to do, right? But Christianity, the way following Jesus, whatever, says, look at what God has already done for us. Look at what God has already done for us. And the third thing is that religion is always asking, what kind of sacrifice do I have to make? in order to get God to like me and accept me? What kind of sacrifice do I need to make? In contrast, Christianity simply says, look at the sacrifice that God has already made and then ask, will you accept his sacrifice? Will you accept his sacrifice? And I would ask you the same thing today. Listen, Jesus in and of himself is the answer to the questions that religion has been asking for thousands of years. And that is why Paul didn't walk out onto that plaza that day and say, oh, you stupid Athenian people with all your crazy religious beliefs, you're 100% wrong about everything. No. He says, you're not completely wrong. Your questions are exactly right. Is there a God? Can I know him? Can I connect with him? Can I be forgiven? Is there eternal life? Your questions are right. And the amazing thing is that many of these men and women of Athens abandoned their whole worldview. They believed, they embraced Jesus, they embraced Christianity, and this crazy, crazy, are you kidding me message began to spread like wildfire all over Greece and Europe and the known world at that time. Now here's what I believe with all of my heart. Again, if we could peel away all the man-made stuff that has way overcomplicated and messed this thing up, if we could somehow peel all of that away, and all we did was really focus in on Jesus, and maybe we got a Bible and we just read the Gospels, or we read this book of Acts that we've looked at today, or we read the book of John, where John says, this is why Jesus came, and this is who he is. I mean, if that's what we had, and somehow we could distance ourselves from all the stuff that we've seen, experienced, whatever, in religious and church circles, I believe that our doubts about religion may remain, but that our doubts about God would probably begin to change. If we could get rid of all the man-made stuff, just really drill down, I believe that our doubts about religion would probably remain, but that our doubts about God would begin to change. Paul said there's something in all of us that seeks. There's something in all of us that wants to know God and to connect with God. 
And this amazing, mind-blowing good news is that God decided to reach back. And God decided to make himself known through the person of Jesus Christ. So that we didn't have to wonder, so that we didn't have to wander, so that we didn't have to check off the boxes and jump through the hoops and do all these kind of things and living our lives with no assurance. Again, Jesus is the embodiment. He's the answer that religion has been asking for a very long time. So as we wrap up today, I want to maybe speak for just a moment to two groups of you. Uh, There might be some of you here today who maybe have never said yes to Jesus. Not yes to religion. Not yes to any of that, but yes to Jesus. And you hear us talking about it. You hear the words of Paul today presenting who Jesus is. And maybe today you're ready to step across that line and commit your life to him and be able to to have God actively involved in your life and helping you along the way. And one day when this life is over, maybe that's you today. And if that's you, in just a moment, I'm going to lead us in a prayer. Uh, Just a kind of a, a rough guide to help you know what to say. You can just repeat it after me quietly to yourself if you want. But then I also want to pray for those of us today, and I think probably more than a couple of us, would find ourselves here, which is that maybe you would say, Howard, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus and I, and I follow Jesus, but I have to admit that I've been pretty trapped in religiosity. I've been pretty trapped in churchianity. I've been kind of caught up in the boxes and the hoops and the legalism rather than truly walking in the freedom and the grace that God wants me to have. And if that's you, I want to invite you to pray a prayer as well. So let me, let me speak to the first group or pray with the first group. Maybe for the first time, you need to pray something along these lines. God, I've blown it. I've messed up. I've made a lot of mistakes. I've sinned and I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I believe Jesus died for me so that I could experience your forgiveness, so I could have a relationship with you, so that I could have you involved in my everyday life, and so that one day when this life is over, I could spend eternity in heaven with you. So God, I ask you to come into my life to take control to lead me in the way that you have for me. And then I would just encourage any of us to pray this in the next part. God, I want to walk in freedom, walk in grace. I don't want to be subject to rules and guilt and check boxes. God, I know you have a purpose for me. I know you have a plan for me. God, I want to I discover that. I want to live that out. I want to do things that you've called me to do, not out of a sense of obligation, not out of a sense of guilt, but out of a sense of gratitude, understanding the enormity of the sacrifice that you made for me. And even if the cross was all you ever gave us, but instead, you decided to shower us with so much more. And I just pray, God, that you would help me to live each day out of grace, out of freedom, out of abundance, out of just gratitude. Help me to break free, to break the chains, and to walk in freedom. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.